Welcome to The Straight Stitch, a podcast about sewing and other fiber arts. This is episode 25, and my name is Janet Zabo. I'll be your guide as we explore all things sewing. I've been home from Sew Expo for almost a week, and today is actually the first time that I've gotten to do any sewing. I did finish a baby quilt on my Q20 the other day, and I'm working on sewing down the binding, but I haven't done any garment sewing, and I haven't done any other kind of sewing, and I was really itching to get back into my sewing room. It's March here in Montana, and even though we still have snow on the ground, I can tell that spring is on the way. I need to get out and clean out my greenhouse because typically I start seeds for my garden toward the end of March, and that's going to be coming up here pretty soon. I've got a couple of classes coming up at the end of the month, and of course, it's the Easter holiday, so there is going to be a lot happening, and I see my sewing time starting to slip away. So I'm going to work very hard to restructure my schedule so that I build in at least a little bit of sewing every week. I watched a documentary yesterday while I was working. Um, It's called Nancy Zeman, Extraordinary Grace, and it's a documentary about Nancy Zeman's life and how she became a TV sewing star and started Nancy's Notions. Um, If you're old enough to remember, she was on television for 30 years, starting in the 1980s. And her story is truly fascinating. It's inspiring. I'll put a link to the documentary It was done by Wisconsin Public Radio, and you can find it on PBS Passport if you have that. You can also watch it on YouTube, and that's where I found it. It popped up in my YouTube feed. I did read Nancy's autobiography some years ago called Seems Extraordinary, and I'll also put a link to that. It's She was just a phenomenal woman, and it's a great story to read. As I mentioned, I finished the baby quilt that I've been working on for my cousin's granddaughter, and I'm currently sewing down the binding. I should have that done by tonight, and then I can get it off in the mail next week. I'm going to put my sister's quilt back on the Q20 so that I am inspired to work on it. It's probably about a third of the way done, and I'd like to keep plugging away at it. I've also got fabric pulled for another scrap quilt. I haven't decided yet exactly what pattern I'm going to use. I have two or three that I'd like to to use. And I say scrap quilt, but I'm going to use fat quarters and cut them up. And this one's going to be probably greens and whites or greens and creams. For some reason in the spring, I always get hit with the bug to use green fabric. Um, so that's probably what's going to be next in the in the quilting queue. I'm just trying to keep going on all of my projects and not let anything languish too much. I'm going to jump right into today's topic. I want to talk about making bags. I noticed when I was at Sew Expo that there were a lot of, not a lot, but there were several bag vendors, including Clume House, which is based in Portland, or Clume House, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, and Lauren Mormino, whose business is called Mormino, M-O-R-E-M-E-K-N-O-W. They were two of the big, big names that I saw at Sew so Expo. And there were some smaller vendors selling purse hardware and webbing and things like that. So I thought it would be a good time to talk about bag making. I'm kind of getting the itch to make bags. And I wanted to talk about the bags that I've made in the past. And if you want to get started making bags, what kinds of things you might be looking for. I'm not quite sure what it is about my personality. I am not a big shoe person. You know, some women are really captivated by shoes and have hundreds of pairs of shoes in their closets. I I really couldn't care less about shoes, but I... I'm a sucker for bags, and if I see a bag that I think I can use, uh, I'm really tempted to pick it up. So I think it was probably only natural that I gravitated toward making bags. I'm trying to remember back to what the first bags I made were, and I think they were 
there were two of them. I started out with the Elizabeth Hartman Perfect Quilted Tote, which I've just checked her website and I don't think she's selling that pattern anymore. Um, I still have it. It was a quilt as you go pattern that was duck cloth with a layer of batting and then you quilted panels onto it. And it was kind of a free form improv type of project, which is, if you know me at all, I'm not a free form or improv type of person, but I had the most fun with that. And I made myself a tote bag with all sorts of red and black and gold musical themed fabrics. And I still use that every Sunday. I carry my piano music to church in it. And it has held up beautifully. It's probably getting close to 10 or 12 years old now. And it was great fun. I had so much fun making it and I really ought to make some more. The other pattern that I made quite a few of was the open wide pouch by Anna Graham of Noodlehead. And she at one point had that as a free pattern and it came in three sizes. And I loved that pattern so much that I actually made 19 of those for all of the girls on my daughter's cheerleading squad when she was in high school so that they could use them as makeup bags. Um, I'm not sure I would ever do that again, but that was a labor of love and I got really good at making that pattern. Those were two fairly simple bag patterns that I was able to make on my Janome 6600. I wanted to branch out though and start making some heavier duty bags and I ran across a company called A.L. Francis Textiles on Etsy and they're based in Texas and they had all sorts of wonderful waxed canvas fabric for sale and they wax their canvas with beeswax that's produced locally where they live in Texas. And so I went a little nuts and bought a whole bunch of waxed canvas from them and started making waxed canvas bags. And it was at that point that I decided I needed something a little bit more heavy duty than my Janome 6600. You will see occasionally people, especially on the vintage sewing machine groups in on Facebook, will put up pictures or advertisements for machines that have been modified as though slapping an industrial motor onto a vintage sewing machine makes it an industrial machine and it doesn't any more than putting a bigger engine into a Ford Pinto would turn it into a pickup truck. That just doesn't happen. Domestic sewing machines don't have the beefy inside components. In fact, I ran across a Singer 201, which is a wonderful domestic sewing machine. I ran across one that had been used for leather work and the linkages were so worn out that that machine probably couldn't sew anything with any degree of integrity anymore. It was just all loosey-goosey inside and that was because somebody had used it to sew materials that it had never been intended to sew. So you will find that I am rather opinionated about this. I always believe in using the best tool for the job, so I started looking for an industrial sewing machine, and I found two. Um, there's a little bit of a story here, so I'll tell you that. I started with a Necky BV, B as in boy, V as in Victor, it's the industrial version of the Necky uh, BF that I have that I use for quilt piecing. And my next to the BV, my Necky BF looks like a little miniature sewing machine. The BV is actually very similar to the Singer 31-15, which is also an industrial machine. And when I say industrial, I'm not talking about heavy duty as much as I'm talking about machines that were built and intended to do one thing and do it over and over and over again and do it extremely well. So the Singer 31-15 and my Necky BV are what I would refer to as light industrials. They were intended for dressmaking. My BV actually came out of a 
department store in Salt Lake City where it had been used to do draperies. So again, not all industrials are made, are created equal. I really wanted an industrial in a treadle table. I spin and I like to spin and I like to treadle on treadle sewing machines. And I thought I really, really wanted to put a light industrial sewing machine into a treadle table. And I happened to be looking on Craigslist one day and I found a Singer 78-1 sewing machine in a treadle table for sale near me for $75. And I called the lady up and went over right away and looked at it and brought it home. And what I really wanted was the treadle table. I had no interest in the Singer 78-1. So I called up my friend Tommy, who has an automobile upholstery business, and I asked him if he would be interested in the Singer 78-1, and he jumped at it. And in hindsight, I wish I hadn't sold him the 78-1, although he was very gracious. And we, I joked that we had joint custody of that machine because if I ever needed to use it for anything, I could go to his shop and pick it up and bring it home and put it in the treadle table and use it and then take it back to him. The thing that made the Singer 78-1 so special is that it's what's called a needle feed machine. Most sewing machines operate with a set of feed dogs that move the fabric through the machine. The 78-1 is a needle feed machine, which means that the needle is actually what moves the fabric or the upholstery or the leather through the machine. There is a distinct difference in sewing on that machine as opposed to sewing on a Singer 31-15 or sewing on my Necky BV. It will handle heavier materials. In any case, I set the Necky BV up into a treadle table and it's sitting here in my office, as a matter of fact, and that was what I used to sew the bags that I made with waxed canvas. If I get too thick with the seams, it'll balk. It doesn't really like six or eight layers of waxed canvas, but for the most part, anything with waxed canvas, I've been able to sew on that machine. Last year, I bought a Juki 1541 True Industrial Sewing Machine. And part of the reason I bought that machine was because my husband keeps bringing me all of these heavy-duty sewing projects. Um, he routinely blows out the crotches in his pants from bending over and crouching down. So those I do on my Necky BV. It takes me about five minutes to mend the seams on those but he was also bringing me projects that needed to be sewn in heavy Cordura, like Thousand Denier Cordura, and the Necky BB doesn't want to do those projects. So I finally broke down and bought a Juki 1541, and that has been a phenomenal machine. I've only used it a little bit. I've made a couple of generator covers for him, but this summer I'm planning to put that machine through its paces, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So do you need an industrial sewing machine to sew bags? No, I don't think you do. There are bags that you can make on domestic machines, and I'll talk about those when we get to talking about some of the patterns. Um, but you do need to be careful not to stress your machine out. You don't want to burn out the motor. If you're breaking needles, that's a great indication that you're asking your machine to do something that it's really not capable of doing. We had uh, one of our members of our sewing group came to our sewing meeting yesterday and she brought a pouch uh, that she had made on her Bernina. And I don't know specifically what Bernina model it was, but she was using fabric with soft and stable and then some thin leather pieces for the bottom. And she said that her Bernina was really struggling to get through that. Uh, combination of materials. So she didn't push it any further and I suggested that we get together sometime this summer and just have a day of sewing here where we can do those kinds of projects on the Juki 1541. So I think she and I will probably get together and make some bags. So I would say if you want to get started making bags, start with the machine that you have. Start with some smaller projects, some uh, less 
heavy material intensive projects and find out if these are things that you would like to make before you think about making the leap to a heavier duty sewing machine or even an industrial model. Some of the bag patterns that you can make on a domestic sewing machine are the By Annie patterns. So ByAnnie.com, their website, a lot of quilt stores carry these patterns. They're very popular. They're not only bag patterns, but they are other kinds of coverings and carryalls. Um, By Annie has a pattern called In the Mix, which is a mixer cover, and I actually made one of those for my older daughter. So there's a wide variety of things to try. I made the By Annie Ultimate Travel Bag, which is a nice, good-sized overnight travel bag, carry-on bag. And the By Annie patterns are extremely well written. They are extremely thorough. There are lots of videos that accompany each pattern so that you can learn about different techniques, things that you may not have done before, like adding mesh or elastic or binding your interior seams, adding zippers. They're good skill building patterns. And the By Annie company also does a great job with providing materials. So when I first started making bags, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, it was hard to find some of these uh, pieces that were specified in the patterns. Purse zippers were hard to find, especially here where I live. I'm in the backwater and I was pretty limited to what I could find at Joanne Fabrics. The buy any patterns are good ones because you can also go to their website and order everything that you need to make the pattern. Besides the ultimate travel bag, I also made the get out of town duffel, which is a little bit smaller and I really enjoyed that pattern as well. That was a lot of fun. The, the buy any patterns are just fun to make. A lot of them involve quilting, although you can use pre-quilted fabrics, but if there's a special fabric that you'd like to quilt, you can do that and use that in the pattern. Little zipper pouches are great for cutting your teeth on bag making. Project pouches where you use vinyl, clear vinyl, those are also good to get some experience working with vinyl fabrics. I was really taken with waxed canvas for some reason. I just thought that waxed canvas was a great substrate. So when I started making waxed canvas patterns, I kind of went nuts. There was a company called Red Rabbit Mercantile and she's no longer in business, unfortunately, which is kind of sad because her patterns were really good. She had one called the Bramble Bag, which I made out of some red waxed canvas from A.L. Francis Textiles on Etsy. And I used that as my daily carrying bag for a year or two. It was a great pattern. I loved the pockets. She also had one called Mr. McGregor's Field Bag, which I made. And that is a great one for toting things around. It's literally what it's described as it's a field bag and if you're familiar with field bags you know that they're typically used to carry ammunition and things like that and I wasn't carrying ammunition but anytime I need to go out in the field as I call it or out to the garden that's a good one to tote some things around in. And then I discovered Anna Graham at Noodlehead and oh my goodness I own probably every single pattern that she's ever released and I've made probably every single one of them. So the ones that are my favorites, I can list them for you. I made a redwood tote and I used that as a purse for a long time. I made the wool and wax tote. I made the fika tote. I made the caravan tote. I made the explorer tote. I made the sandhill sling. And most of these I made out of waxed canvas. She does a phenomenal job with her patterns. Uh, her patterns are well illustrated. They are excellently proofread. You'll hardly ever find an error in any of her patterns. 
She usually designs her bags in multiple sizes, so you can make a small version and a large version. You can make them out of various fabrics. She has suggestions for things that you might use, like waxed canvas or quilted cotton, um, similar to the By Annie bags, or vinyl. There is a tremendous amount of room for creativity in her patterns. And with the last couple of patterns, I know with the Sandhill Sling and with the Oxbow Tote that she just released, she's also doing accompanying videos, uh, video sew-alongs on YouTube, and those are really helpful. Even if you don't need help with the sewing part of it, just being able to watch her and how she works is incredibly educational. I would say that the two bag projects that I've done that I'm most proud of are the Clume House Slabtown backpack and the Betts White Ravenwood Messenger bag. So let's talk about the Clume House patterns first. These are also some of the most well-written patterns I've ever seen in my entire life. And I wrote patterns for a long time as a knitting designer, so I'm a little particular about pattern writing and about how things are expressed in writing. And the Clum House patterns are top notch. I started out with their Fremont tote, and that one went so well that I decided to tackle the Slabtown backpack. I would recommend if you're going to do the backpack, get the kit. There, a lot of these uh, bag pattern makers also sell either kits or they sell all the supplies to make their patterns which is incredibly helpful because if you have to source all of this stuff, not only is it going to be frustrating, but it's going to be expensive and you're not going to find exactly what you need when you need it. So I would suggest getting the kit. Clum House patterns are also uh, one of the things that Ellie Lum, who's the owner, makes a point of is saying that these can be done on domestic machines. Um, it's, it's a fine line. I'm not sure that I entirely agree with her. I know that in her workshops, she recommends the Singer Heavy Duty sewing machine that I think you can get at Joanne Fabrics. And I actually have sewn on that machine and it's not a bad machine and it probably will do exactly what she says it will do. Some of the lighter weight machines just may not have the punching power to do something like the a slab town backpack. I did it on my necky BV and I was able to do it. If I do it again and I'm kicking around the idea of doing it again, I would do it on the 1541. The way that pattern is written, it's broken down into manageable bite-sized pieces. So you can do maybe an hour's worth of work on it a day and in a week you can have it done. You don't have to do it all at once which I find helpful. Sometimes I've only got an hour or so to sew or I don't want to tear off a big chunk of sewing. And that was a good project to do in that way. I've used that backpack a lot. I took it on a trip that I went on last year and it's, it's great. I love it. I love the design. It's a sturdy backpack. And if you're interested in making a backpack, that's a great one. If you haven't made a backpack before, I might start with one of her simpler patterns, but certainly even a novice bag maker could tackle that with a little bit of determination. Betts White designed the Ravenwood Messenger bag, and that's another project that I've done that I'm really proud of. I did that one in 2018, and the only reason I remember specifically what year I made that bag was two things. I belonged to a bag of the month club. There was a group on Facebook and I joined and for six months uh, you got a bag, different bag pattern every month and that was one of the bag patterns that came as part of that club. The other reason I remember making it in 2018 was because I started it the day that I came down with the flu in February of 2018 and Literally, I had made dinner, eaten dinner, went upstairs to work on the bag, and within a half an hour, I was in bed. That's how fast it happened. And that was also the episode of the flu that led to pneumonia and that landed me in the ICU on a ventilator for a week. 
um, which is not an experience that I would like to repeat. I lost an entire week of my life because I was sedated the whole time. But I remember coming home and it took me a good six or eight weeks to get over that experience. And as part of my therapy of getting over it, I worked on finishing the Ravenwood messenger bag. So I made that out of waxed canvas from AL Textiles again, AL Francis Textiles. And I've actually started another one. I need to go fish it out of timeout where it's been for a couple of months and get back to finishing it because um, I need a back. I need another messenger bag like that. It's actually like a briefcase style. And I had given the first one I made to a friend of mine. Um, so I'm kind of itching to finish the one that I've started for myself. And now that I have the Juki 1541, I think making that one's going to be an absolute snap. So now that I've given you kind of a quick overview of my favorite bag making patterns, let's talk in depth about the supplies that you will need. I've already mentioned sewing machines. Some of these bag patterns can be made on domestic sewing machines. Some of them require a little bit heavier duty sewing machine. If you are going to use a domestic sewing machine, I would make sure that you have a jeans needle or a denim needle. These needles are coated to make them a little bit stiffer so they don't flex quite as much. The worst thing that you can have happen is to have a, a sewing machine needle flex and deflect and hit the needle plate on your machine which it can do if it hits material that it's is too thick for it or if you're pushing or pulling and trying to get force material through your machine uh, what happens is that needle will hit the needle plate it can nick the needle plate it can uh, break the needle in the worst case scenario it will put your machine out of timing which means that the needle will not be in the correct position to pick up the bobbin thread when it goes down into the bobbin area. You'll know that that's what's going on because you won't be able to make any stitches. And that usually requires a trip to a service center to have somebody put your machine back in time. So there are good reasons not to force your machine to do something that it's not intended to do. But certainly most of the biani patterns can be done on a domestic machine. And I think this, the, some of the Clumhouse patterns can be done on a domestic machine. And I believe Ellie Lum has YouTube videos and suggestions about how to make that happen without damaging your machine. You might find some specialty feet to be helpful. If you're going to be using leather or vinyl or anything that's kind of sticky. A Teflon foot and even a Teflon needle plate are great additions. If you don't have a Teflon foot or a Teflon needle plate, sometimes placing tissue paper underneath the foot or between the fabric and the feed dogs will help to make sure that the fabric goes through smoothly. You can also put a piece of uh, clear scotch tape on the bottom of your presser foot and that will also help you not to get hung up on sticky fabrics like vinyl or oil cloth or leather things like that. I've got both a Teflon presser foot and a Teflon needle plate on my Neki BV and they work really really well. You'll probably want a zipper foot for putting in zippers a left and right zipper foot or one that you can adjust to be a left or right zipper foot is a great addition. I like on my Neki BV what's called a compensating foot and that's actually a two-part foot. So one side of it will ride lower than the other side. And what that allows you to do is if you're top stitching along a seam and you have a the part where your top stitching is elevated a little bit above the other layer of fabric, the compensating foot will ride along that seam and give you a really, really nice top stitch. I bought a set of compensating feet for my Neki BV from Qtex. 
they came in a variety of widths so you can get um, you can get your needle position various distances away which is helpful because on that machine it's not computerized so there's no way to move the needle if you don't have compensating feet or a compensating foot, an edge stitch foot will allow you to do something similar and get a really nice line of top stitching. Speaking of top stitching, let's talk about needles. I've already mentioned the denim or the jeans needle. If you're sewing with vinyl or something that's a little bit sticky or might leave residue on your needle, Schmetz does make a vinyl needle and it's coated so it's intended to go through those stickier materials without getting hung up. The other needle that you might want to buy is a top stitching needle and we'll talk a little bit more about thread in a minute but a top stitching needle allows you to use a thicker thread because it's got a larger eye and that allows you to do the kind of top stitching details that you see on bags that you might purchase. In terms of size, you're absolutely going to be wanting to use the larger size needles. So the 90 slash 14 or 100 slash 16, the heavier and thicker the fabric, the larger the machine needle that you're going to want to use. So let's talk about thread and I'm going to give you a quick and dirty on thread because there's a, an entirely different naming system for thread weights when you start getting into the heavier threads. Um, I will be honest and tell you that for most of the waxed canvas bags I made on my Necky BB, I used Coates and Clark heavy duty thread from Joanne Fabrics and it worked beautifully. It's a smooth thread, it gives great detail on top stitching, and I found it economical and easy to find. It came in most of the colors that I needed, so that's a good one to start with. The two types of thread that you'll probably run into when you start making bags, um, if you end up with an industrial machine, are nylon and polyester. I prefer polyester. Nylon has to be finished off by burning, otherwise it frays. So I like polyester threads. This was one of the places that I really struggled was what combination of thread and needle to use. And I'm gonna put a link in the show notes to the threadexchange.com website because they've got an excellent chart that covers the different kinds of thread and the different thread weights and what size needles are appropriate. I'm gonna talk about three of the thread weight systems. Um, weight is the first one and a smaller weight number indicates a heavier thread. So the weight of a thread is actually the length measurement. So for instance, if you see something that's labeled a 40 weight thread, that means that 40 kilometers of that thread weighs one kilogram. A 30 weight thread would be heavier because there would only be 30 kilometers of thread in one kilogram. I wish we had gone to the metric system when I was a kid. It would make things so much simpler. Denier is another way to measure thread weights, and that is weight in grams of 9,000 meters of thread. So if 9,000 meters of thread weighs 120 grams, that makes it 120 denier. Larger numbers are heavier threads. Similarly, tex is the weight in grams of a thousand meters of thread. So if a thousand meters weighs 25 grams, it's tex 25. Larger tex numbers are heavier threads. This can all get terribly confusing and I would print out these uh, thread guides and laminate them in, or put them in a notebook and keep them next to your sewing machine because I still refer to mine periodically. I will tell you that the size thread that I typically use on my Juki 1541 is a Tex 70 and that is the largest size thread that a domestic sewing machine can handle. It gives nice top stitching detail. It's um, I've used it for construction on heavier things when I'm making lighter things. On my lighter items on my Juki 1541, sometimes I'll drop down to a Tex 35 for construction, um, which is just because I don't want the bulk of the thread in the seam. 
And there are lots of good suppliers for thread. Um, I've gotten thread from the Thread Exchange. I've also gotten it from Wawak. And I'll put links to all the suppliers in the show notes. When it comes to fabric, you have a wide variety of fabrics to use for making bags. You can use vinyl. And I'll tell you that the vinyl nowadays is not anything like the vinyl that we grew up with. There are much nicer vinyls out there. Lauren Mormino's booth at Sew Expo had some absolutely gorgeous vinyls. I was really tempted to buy some, but I don't really need another project right now. I need to use up what I've got here. Marine vinyl is easy to find because that's what Joanne Fabrics carries, but honestly, if you're going to make vinyl bags, look for a different supplier and look for some of these nicer vinyls. You really do get what you pay for. The same thing goes with cork. There's really nice cork and there's not so nice cork. And the not so nice cork might look good for a while, but then it'll start to crack and fall apart. So again, you'll, you'll want to look for a reputable supplier of cork fabric. I haven't used a lot of cork, so if anybody has a favorite cork supplier, please put it in the show notes because, or drop a comment on the episode page because we'd all like to know. I have bought a fair bit of Cordura because I make uh, generator covers for my husband's construction equipment. And I've also used some of the lighter Cordura as lining for some of my waxed canvas bags. The place that I like to get Cordura fabric is Seattle Fabrics. Um, I know where they are in Seattle. I drive by them frequently. Sometimes I go in there in person, although they haven't had in-person shopping since the pandemic, but they have an extensive website and their shipping department is very responsive. I've ordered things and had them a day or two later. Granted, I'm only, you know, two states away, but still they tend to send out their stuff pretty quickly. Canvas is a great fabric to make bags out of. Again, you can go to Joanne Fabrics and get the 10 ounce duck canvas, and I do make canvas grocery bags out of that. But Ruby Star Society and Art Gallery Fabrics both have really nice canvas substrates. Anna Graham at Noodlehead has her own line of canvas fabrics. There are lots of really nice canvas fabrics out there that make wonderful bags. You can also use home deck fabric or upholstery fabric. If you're lucky enough to live someplace where you can get offcuts or remnants, those are great to use for smaller bags like wristlets or little pouches. Be creative. There are suppliers for leather. If you're as old as I am, you'll remember Tandy Leather and they're still in business and you can order leather from them. But there are also other leather suppliers. You can get vegan leather now. Again, leather is not something that I've worked with extensively, but uh, if you have a favorite leather supplier, by all means, let us know that too. As I said before, my favorite substrate for making bags is hands down waxed canvas. I really like the A.L. Francis Textiles waxed canvas on Etsy. I've got several rolls of that and I've made a number of bags. They've held up really well. They're very well waxed. You want to make sure when you're using a waxed canvas that it's actually waxed, that it's not just plain canvas because you won't get the benefits of the waxed canvas. The Clumhouse Waxed Canvas is also a vegan product, so if that's something that's important to you, check them out. I would say that that waxed canvas is a little bit thinner than the A.L. Francis Waxed Canvas. I've made bags out of both. There are times that I would choose the Clumhouse Waxed Canvas, and there are times that I would choose the A.L. Francis Waxed Canvas. You might want to get swatches of each and just have them on hand so that you know what the differences are. I did make the Slabtown backpack out of the Clumhouse Vegan Waxed Canvas. It tends to have um, what I would call an oilier finish. In fact, a couple of the rolls that I got benefited from being left out to dry out a little bit before I started working with them. 
and I didn't find that to be the case with the beeswax waxed canvas. So again, it's just, you know, what, what you need for your end product and what you want to work with. There are some suppliers now that are selling waterproof canvas, which is, I believe, a polyester based fabric. And you can make items out of that. But what I find most people using it for is waterproof linings. Obviously, bag making is one of those hobbies that you can spend a whole lot of time and money on. It's a matter of how far you want to go. I haven't even talked about hardware. Um, I'll mention another pattern company that I like is Sally Tomato. And Sally Tomato also has hardware kits for their bag patterns. And I find that so helpful because I was trying to source some of this hardware and you could find one inch D-rings, but they wouldn't be in the color that you needed. Or you could find gate hooks, but they wouldn't have the uh, size that you needed for the webbing that you were using. Or you could find webbing, but it wasn't in the color that you wanted. So it's getting better, like a lot of things. You know, when more people start doing it, then you find that the supplies become easier to source. But finding companies that offer the hardware packages along with their patterns is huge. I feel like I've really only scratched the surface here. If you have other suggestions, things that I didn't cover, let me know. I would love to get a bag maker on the show to interview and talk about bag design, so I'm going to work on that. I have someone in mind, but if anybody has any suggestions, let me know. That goes for anything on the show. If you have suggestions about guests you'd like to see, please let me know. Drop me a line, Janet at JanetZabo.com. And now's the time when I politely ask if you would go to iTunes and give me a review or a rating. I'm up to nine ratings and they're all fives, which is phenomenal. I can always use more five-star ratings because that helps other people find the podcast. The podcast is on Spotify. I also have a YouTube channel, even though it's an audio only podcast. I do put the audio up on YouTube. So if you want to listen that way, that's available. The podcast has a website at thestraightstitchpodcast.com. You can find show notes for each episode there. You can leave comments, suggestions. Again, the email is Janet at JanetZabo.com. I'd love to hear from you if you have any suggestions about future episodes. And I think that's probably going to do it for today's episode. So until next time, I hope you have a great week and you get to go sew something.